March 18th, 2009, an attractive professional woman made her way home from her job on the University of York campus. This is the sort of thing that happens to other people. It doesn't happen to you, to your daughter, to your family. She would later speak to her parents by phone, arranging to meet her mother for Mother's Day. This was the last they would hear from her. It is extraordinary that a 35-year-old woman in full-time employment can just completely vanish. Her friend texted her on Thursday evening when she didn't turn up for a drink. When she hadn't received a response from Claudia by Friday morning, the alarm was raised. She had simply disappeared. It's a major mystery, probably one of the biggest mysteries of any crimes I've ever covered, and with a total lack of explanation of what had happened to that woman. It's astonishing to think that in this era of CCTV, forensic science and cell towers, that someone can simply slip through the cracks and disappear. How is it possible that someone can simply vanish without a trace? And what hope do the investigators have when the trail goes cold? I'm criminologist Donald McIntyre, and in this series, I've brought together an unrivaled team of specialist investigators. We'll work with the original detectives to re-examine and to bring to light new information, and hopefully to find some closure for the friends and families of the victims of some of the most shocking and impenetrable cold cases. On this programme, the shocking disappearance of Claudia Lawrence, the 35-year-old chef who walked home from work and vanished without a trace. We confer with leading investigators and my team of experts strive to answer what happened to Claudia Lawrence. afternoon of March 18th, 2009, Claudia Lawrence walked home from the Roger Kirk Centre on the University of York campus. She was never seen again after that day at work, and it's a mystery that has baffled investigators since, and one which I'm hoping, with the passage of time, we might be able to shed some light on. My expert cold case team have helped advise and solve some of Britain's toughest investigations, bringing fresh perspectives and new analysis to crimes that have stalled over time. Clive Driscoll is a former Detective Chief Inspector with Scotland Yard. He has led many noted investigations over the course of his 35-year career. He has seen many cases like this one and understands its complexity. In addition, we've also enlisted the help of Nicola Talent. Nicola has written on many high-profile cases in the course of her work and has a detailed knowledge of this investigation. You're quite a complex lady, really. I think that she was probably trying to live in two lives. She doesn't represent the normal victim. She tried to end the relationship, or maybe she threatened somebody that she was going to tell about a relationship. Somebody could have uh, offered a lift, someone she knew. With their years of experience in the field of criminal justice, perhaps my team can uncover new leads in this mystery. So just who was Claudia Lawrence? And why would anyone have any reason to attack, abduct, or even murder her? Claudia was from York, Yorkshire's county town, the younger daughter of solicitor Peter Lawrence and his wife Joan. Theirs was an unremarkable yet pleasant middle-class life. Malton, the town where she grew up with her parents and her sister Ali, was also middle-class. By all accounts, her childhood was happy and secure, with much the same interests as other girls from a similar background. She seemed like she'd had a really ordinary upbringing. 
I know her and her sister loved their ponies. From what I was told, they were out on their horses, looking after their horses. I went riding, um, and this was the, the main interest. I remember Ali telling me her and Claudia used to get the train to school together, laughing, joking, you know, normal sisters. Very caring, very kind person with a nice personality, sense of humour. She was popular with her friends here in Moulton and uh, her friends in York. Claudia owned her own home, a Victorian house on Hayworth Road, which was a huge achievement for a girl of her age on a chef's salary. Claudia worked here as a chef in one of the many kitchens on site at the University of York campus. She enjoyed her work, got on with her colleagues and showed no signs of wanting to change her job or indeed career path. She went to um, York College Catering Department and she just had a natural talent for it. Started working in pubs, um, one in Moulton, which is the area she grew up, quite, you know, rural North Yorkshire. It seems wherever she went, she was popular, made, you know, made friends. Everyone I met just seemed to really like her. She passed her exams without any trouble. And then she went eventually to the university and the hours were better. As with many cases I've seen in the past, there is always the possibility that Claudia just wanted to change her life and start again. But were there circumstances in her personal life that the investigation has so far failed to identify that would have caused her to disappear of her own accord? People do want to change their lives. People do disappear and reinvent themselves. But often there is evidence about that desire in their life that they previously had had. They've gone bankrupt, they've had a terrible divorce, they owe lots of money, they talk about wanting to disappear and start again. But there's nothing in Claudia Lawrence's background that suggests that she wanted to disappear and become someone else. I can't think of any reason why she would just go and leave everything in her home. Uh, I, I just don't know. Without having to delve too deeply into Claudia's situation, I've been able to verify what most people say about her. She was happy, popular, and there appears to me and my cold case team to be no apparent reason why she would want to go missing. Claudia is missing. There's still no evidence that a murder has taken place. Is there any chance she could have just decided to upstick, reinvent herself, as others, thousands do every year? I don't think she's the type of person who's going to feel a need to reinvent herself. She does have a lifestyle that may not suit everyone. She's happy with her job. She turns up on time. She's made plans, made arrangements. I don't think there's, a, there's anything to suggest there that she may have gone and reinvented herself with what. And it isn't that easy to do that. There's no doubt that Claudia was popular. She was charming, attractive, and made friends easily. She had ties with a number of people in Cyprus, and she'd spent some time on the small Mediterranean island. She was a very gregarious young woman, and there were lots of people in York who met her at clubs and, and in bars and pubs and got on with her really well. A very sociable lady, a lot of friends, a lot of acquaintances, and anyone you speak to say they cannot understand at all why she would have disappeared other than she's been taken by somebody against her will. We realized right from the beginning that it was an unusual case. There are missing people, obviously, all the time, and the police will sometimes try to gain quite a bit of publicity locally for someone who's gone missing for all sorts of reasons. But this quite clearly was something extra. Right from the word go, I had a feeling this was going to be a very big case. There's just that feeling about it, and so it's proved. It's a mystery which stunned a nation and devastated a family. How could a beautiful woman with so much to live for simply disappear? So what could possibly have happened to Claudia? 
We've pretty much established that she didn't have any reason to go missing. She didn't have any enemies that we know of. So does her personal life hold the key to the mystery? Was she associating with a person or persons who needed Claudia Lawrence out of the way? Coming up, we examine Claudia's movements on the day she went missing. We bring some new insight into the case and we reveal some of the mistakes made early on in the investigation. 35-year-old chef Claudia Lawrence vanished without a trace from her home in York in March 2009. Despite continued efforts by local police and investigations carried out abroad, she has never been found. I've assembled a cold case team of seasoned experts to revisit Claudia's case in a bid to better understand how this successful young woman simply disappeared. I've spent time in York and spoken to people who knew her. Everything they've told me confirms the widely held view that she was most likely taken against her will. Everything I've heard indicates that her life was normal, secure and happy right up to the last day she was seen. To all intents and purposes, Claudia's day was an uneventful one. From her conversations with her mother and texts with friends, it appeared that nothing was amiss. When she left the campus, she took the same route home she always took, passing through Melrose Gate, which would take her up to her home in Hayworth. Some of the last images of Claudia were caught by the CCTV system at this post office. She was seen to post a letter as she walked home from work on the last day she was seen alive. Who was the recipient and is that significant to the investigation? After walking past the Melrose Gate Bridge, Claudia was offered a lift home by a colleague who was driving past. She was dropped outside her house at around 10 to 3. However, she went back out and was last spotted walking back towards her house about 15 minutes later. No one has come forward with any information about what she did over the course of the next few hours. It's an information gap that remains and it could be crucial to the investigation. We know Claudia arrived home safely because upon arrival, she phoned her mom to make arrangements for Mother's Day. What happened later that evening remains a mystery. On the Wednesday before she disappeared, I spoke to her in the afternoon and again in the evening, uh, between 8 and 8.30. And she was perfectly all right, she was fine. And she was just about to go to bed because she was on an early start the next morning, so she usually went to bed by 9. We were both watching the same television programme and I could hear it in her home, in her bedroom. The last text message sent from Claudia's phone was at approximately 8.23 p.m. She received a text from a friend in Cyprus almost an hour later, to which she did not reply. She had made calls to her parents, which the police have never revealed where she was when they made those calls. And of course, they have a pretty good idea from the cell phone data. But for operational reasons, they've kept that to themselves. And having made those calls, she wasn't heard from again. Claudia's phone signal went down around midnight and police believe that it was turned off deliberately. She was known to have used her phone constantly during work breaks and other downtimes. I agree with the police. It's highly unlikely that Claudia would have allowed her phone battery to run down naturally. On the evening she was last seen, there was suspicious activity picked up by CCTV around Claudia's home. Around 7.15 p.m. that evening, a man is seen walking with what appears to be a bag on his shoulder into the alley behind Claudia's house. As he walks out just over one minute later, he clearly waits for a passerby to move on before he leaves the alleyway. What caused him to do that? Then again, at around 5.07 a.m. on Thursday morning, a man walks into the alley and returns less than a minute later. So is this the same man? If he had been a local, he surely would have been caught on CCTV in the days before and after Claudia went missing. He's never been identified and he's never come forward. So he must remain a person of interest. Claudia's literally never been seen since. No trail, no body, no evidence.
When the horrifying news came through, her mother was at her sister Ali's house. We had a phone call early evening. Ali answered the phone, and it was a father saying that Claudia had disappeared. Um, and that was nearly 48 hours after she had disappeared. She was last heard from on that Wednesday. The father reported her missing on the Friday and they had the first news conference in York on the Monday morning. I have no idea what happened in the, the time, those 48 hours. I just don't know why it took so long and what happened. I never, I can't get my head around that one. When the police examined Claudia's house, they found a set of unidentified partial fingerprints and also the DNA from a male left-handed smoker on a cigarette butt in her car. However, nothing in the house seemed amiss. There were breakfast dishes in the kitchen sink, her electric toothbrush on the draining board, her bed made, and her phone charger still there. Claudia's handbag, bank cards, passport and jewellery were also there, but her phone and the rucksack she used to carry her chef's whites to work were gone. So everything very much implied she'd left for work on the Thursday morning, and this featured heavily in the original investigation. Well, the whole thing's very mysterious because absolute lack of any forensic evidence, certainly in the early stages of the investigation. No sign of a disturbance inside her house. She's made these two phone calls to her parents on that Wednesday night and since then silence. As a criminologist and an investigator, I work with motive, means and opportunity. But in Claudia's case, because she's missing, we don't know the motive. We can't know the means. So that leaves us with opportunity. In a case like this, that's not a very good start. We've got a situation here where this young lady leaves home at five o'clock in the morning to walk to work. This is a cold, dark, damp March morning. She's on a, a main route through. This is actually, this is her most vulnerable point. There are many opportunities for an opportunistic abduction, an opportunistic, um, or even somebody that she may have known saw her walking to work and offered her a lift to work. So, opportunist or someone she knew? My experts are in little doubt. Clive, what odds do you place on the fact that she might have been taken or abducted on her way to work? I think the hours she was working that particular day as well would have meant that she possibly was walking down that road alone. I think even at that hour, there, you said it, it was a thoroughfare, wasn't it? You, you would be taking a real risk bundling someone into a car, and I'm, my guess is that she would have put up a fight, so... I suppose I'm leaning towards somebody she knew more than someone who just grabbed her off the street and uh, forced her to get into a car. The senior policeman leading the investigation at the time, Ray Galloway, certainly believed that Claudia had disappeared on her way to work. He and his colleagues had leads on a couple arguing on University Road that morning, and a left-handed smoker was also seen in the area just a little bit earlier. He focused on that walk to work and he had evidence that it would appear people had seen someone arguing. There was the person with a cigarette who was they were looking for, who'd been standing by the side of the road. There were a number of incidents that over the coming weeks they thought was important. They made big appeals for, were you this person? Did you see this activity? The police cannot be sure whether she was uh, taken inside a house or, as her father believes, that she was attacked somewhere on her way walking to work that following morning, uh, very early hours in the morning, half past five. But what if Claudia never made the walk to work? What if she was already dead? The problem, though, for the investigators is that there's no evidence of foul play at her home. There's no sign of any disturbance in that house, so we're told. Her bank account's never been touched, her passport's never been touched. This young lady was presumed to be at home, yet there is no evidence of a crime committed at home. They're looking at an alleyway at the rear that is a, a possible way of moving a body, yet we've got no evidence of that at all. Realistically, domestic murders will always leave a crime scene if there's been, because there's anger involved, because people uh, are emotional. So there will be a disturbance, there will be a trail of disturbance left. So this is a most unusual situation. As I've already said, no body, no evidence, and it appears, no signs of a struggle. I suppose the most significant thing in all of this, Clive, is that the absence of a crime scene 
if this was a crime perpetrated by someone known to her, close to her, would one not expect you know, a body you know, in a uh, blast of anger, frustration or sexual jealousy to be some sense of crime scene? There is a crime scene somewhere, if indeed Claudia has actually lost her life, but it, 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 and it may well have been apparent if we could have found it. I think the problem is we've never found it. Certainly what they found in Claudia's house didn't really appear to me to be somewhere where something untoward had happened and then something had been removed. It seemed almost normality what they found. Um, so Claudia, I believe, was whatever happened, happened away from that house. We don't actually know where that scene is. Coming up, could what the police describe as her rogues gallery of associates have anything to do with her disappearance? And is the complexity of her private life the secret to solving the case? <laughs> 35-year-old Claudia Lawrence vanished from her home in the Hayworth area of York in March 2009. There was no crime scene, almost no forensic evidence, and no body. Six weeks after Claudia's disappearance, her investigation was reclassified to a suspected murder. This now reclassified investigation was to face further obstacles. Both Claudia's physical and personal characteristics were misrepresented from the outset. I was tipped off by a security guard at the university who had seen her the day before she went missing, or the, I think actually the day, the last day she was seen alive. And he said to me, you know, she didn't have blonde hair. And I said, I beg your pardon. He said, I know she had dark hair. The original photograph, I wasn't consulted or anything. I didn't know anything about it. I don't know where it came from on the original poster. Um, and I mentioned that she didn't look like that when she disappeared because I'd been with her the week before and she'd had auburn highlights put in her hair. A very close friend of mine in Malton, he'd telephoned the police and I understand around half a dozen people had phoned the incident team to say it was the wrong photograph. And if you look at the pictures that are now used on the police posters, it is a girl with brown hair, not with blonde hair. It took a lot of long time to get the right photograph out there. I, whether it's made any difference, I don't know. Claudia's parents divorced in 1999 when she was an adult, and they're now estranged. This has added an extra layer of complexity to the investigation. Claudia's mother and Claudia's father do not speak. It's a pretty unusual circumstance for a solicitor's daughter in a market town in North Yorkshire to go missing. And that has caused challenges for the police, I know, and for journalists, for certain, because it means that there isn't an open and unified front from the family. There are two sides from the family. And sometimes you get slightly different stories, or sometimes you get a slightly different uh, access to information. It has made it more challenging. However, it was Claudia's private life that was going to prove the most controversial part of the whole investigation. I think it wasn't just what I learned about Claudia, it was what the police learned about Claudia. When Ray Galloway made those first comments, this is completely out of character. The problem was the police then didn't know what Claudia's character was. It's apparent to me from all the people I've met in the course of reviewing this case that Claudia was a really popular girl. She was attractive to men and was easy in their company. But it also appears that she had some very complex relationships. The details of the complexity of her relationships is something not even her closest friends knew about. The original police team were not told by some of the people close to Claudia how she lived her life. The secret that the police have always believed lay in her intricate uh, web of relationships. The people with whom she worked with saw one Claudia. The people with, who she socialised with perhaps saw another Claudia. And then there was perhaps another Claudia. And the police team that came in 
was on a very sharp learning curve because they discovered that actually she had had relationships with some people who you wouldn't necessarily have expected someone in her position to have had relationships with. Peter, her father, doesn't accept it. He says he doesn't recognise this lifestyle, and yet most other people you speak to do recognise this lifestyle. We know that Claudia had some clandestine relationships, and as a result, some of the men were not in a position to be forthcoming about their connections to her. Perhaps the most important new information they came up with was the sure knowledge that people were lying to them. And that's what the new senior investigating officer, Di Malin, has said and repeatedly said. We know that people are lying to us and we will find you. Probably the biggest problem the police have had in this is they've known right from the beginning who she had relationships with. And they've got to these men and the force for obvious reasons say, well, no, 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 we don't have a relationship with them. And they've had to go away and probe further and go back and say, we now know you did have a relationship. And that's held the investigation up a lot. Newspaper journalists themselves were having problems getting to the bottom of what these relationships that Ray Galloway had alluded to were. Some of the people that we wanted to talk to didn't want to talk to us. Some of them uh, had lifestyles that weren't necessarily compatible with our openly answering questions from either journalists or from the police. And I was threatened on this investigation and I was warned off on this investigation, which is pretty unusual for a murder inquiry of a solicitor's daughter in a rural market town in North Yorkshire. This pub, the Nags Head, located just a few doors down the road from her house, was somewhere Claudia spent a great deal of time. She was well known to the staff and to many of the customers. She was a regular drinker in the next head. Her father, Peter Lawrence, was also there with her regularly in that. She had a close circle of friends. No matter how wide-ranging this investigation has been, they've been to places like Cyprus. It's come back very, very close to that community and the community surrounding the Nags Head pub. Obviously, the Nags Head has been searched a couple of times and lots of mystery has always surrounded it and, and rumours and about what might have gone on there. We know that most murders are solved by looking very carefully at the friend and friendship group. So very, very much local people who I think hold the key to this. She had relationships with people that other girls of her age and her upbringing might have wanted nothing to do with. And that causes massive problems. Where do you look? If you don't know who she was seeing, if you don't know where she was going, and you don't know whether the people you're talking to who do know are telling you the truth, how do you solve the murder? So mystery and some confusion surrounds Claudia's personal life, and it's a mystery which needs to be cleared up. What do you make of Claudia Lawrence and her profile as a victim? Quite a complex lady, really. You could argue maybe possibly living two lives, and one where she was, uh, I think, very much looking after her feelings of her family, and two, it appears that she was also pursuing a life which she was quite entitled to of, of having quite a few boyfriends. And, and, and that part of her life, I think that, um, you know, having spoken to her mother, I think that she, she quite hid from the family. I think she would be a challenging victim in as much as the police would have to maybe go down some roads which would, might cause a little bit of embarrassment and might cause just a little bit of upset in an investigation which needs to be done because you need to try and find out what's happened to Claudia. Nicola, this is an individual who was in control of most areas of her life. She, was, she wasn't chaotic, she was well groomed, she turned up for work, yet this terrible thing happened to her. She doesn't represent the normal victim of an abduction if that was what happened. No, she doesn't, but in common with lots of others, she has a sort of a double life, a secret life going on as well. She was having relationships with married men, and all that is always done under the radar in secret. So Clive, what details stand out for you? What are the key points where you think would be the focus of an investigation if you were in charge? The next head, because certainly what I know about this case, I think there are people for whatever reason that say things in public and outside the police investigation that they haven't felt able 
to give to the police investigation. Some of the information that was given to the police in, in the early stages is probably not correct now. I think people were more concerned about their you know, matrimonial status and, and maybe the embarrassment to them when they gave certain statements. And so the key bit for me is to try and win the confidence back. So if you could get them to come forward, I think we could move this forward and, and hopefully find out what's happened to Claudia. Having been portrayed at the start of the investigation as one type of person, the police then had to disclose the less conventional side of Claudia's life. When they realised that some of the men that she'd been involved with, they were described to me by an officer working on the case as a rogues gallery, some of the people that she was involved with. When they realised that, they had a difficult job to do. Did they tell the public that there was a rogues gallery? that would mean that some people who are watching it will think, well, in that case, I'm not interested. It, you know, it serves her right, which is obviously an awful thing to think. And the police didn't want people to think that because the information wouldn't come forward. Nor could they continue with the line that was, was out there, which was, you know, Claudia was just like your daughter or my daughter leading a life entirely in the open. I've seen that how the victim is portrayed is incredibly important to every investigation. And it's become clear that Claudia's personality was portrayed negatively from the outset. Claudia's sex life, her alleged extramarital affairs and her active sex life, for example, were represented as being a key part of her as a person as well as the wider case. Some of the main ways or the main phrases that were used to describe her were things like scarlet woman, home wrecker. And it's that kind of narrative which has very gendered underlying assumptions, which is really only typical for women victims. We are led to blame Claudia as a victim for putting herself in these arguably compromising positions, whereas actually the blame shouldn't be on Claudia, it should be on the perpetrator. So what was wrong with Claudia living her life any way she chose? And did the stories which emerged, in addition to being hurtful to her family, damage the investigation? She had boyfriends, she, you know, went on dates with men, but she, um... I mean, they don't tell the story that, that has come out since, that she was this man-eating, home-wrecking woman. She was just a 35-year-old woman leading a perfectly lawful life. The fact that her, the life that she led was not perhaps as entirely open as yours or mine, it doesn't mean it's wrong at all. She was, she's a victim. And her family are obviously victims of what's happened to her. Tragically, she was a victim of the media who not only destroyed her reputation, but also as a consequence, damaged the investigation. To see all these lies in the paper about your daughter, it was just awful, it really was terrible. It's so, so very, very difficult to describe it. People make implicit assumptions, often based on the feeling about this person might have brought the problem onto themselves in some way. And the problem about doing that, both in terms of the police doing that or in terms of the public doing that, is that you lose those opportunities to appeal to people to come forward with information, to make people want to invest emotionally with that victim to catch the perpetrator who has done harm to that victim. So it actually reduces the possibility that there will be a result in the case. All of these inconsistencies and the way Claudia was portrayed damaged the investigation. Coming up, I review all the evidence and reveal my conclusions on what really happened to Claudia Lawrence. 35-year-old Claudia Lawrence vanished without a trace from her home in York in March 2009. Despite continued efforts by local police and investigations carried out abroad, she has never been found. The police have made some arrests, but no one has been officially charged, and this has created some hostility in the community towards the whole investigation. In the course of the investigation, Claudia has been portrayed as someone with a complicated personal life. 
While elements of this portrayal may be true, I've no doubt that all of this has hampered the investigation. And now, like the police, anyone, including myself, who asks questions about what happened to Claudia comes up against a brick wall of silence. Well, if you go in the next head, which was Claudia's drinking uh, pub, and uh, where, where she drank with all her friends and various uh, other people, um, they are very sceptical. You're, you're, I walk in there and people will tell me the names of some of these men who have been arrested before I knew them, and they'll say, so-and-so, so-and-so, he would never have done something like that. And another comment is, whose life are they going to wreck next, the police? You know, as if they're going through them one by one and these people are being held up to the light. There's a feeling in the community that they don't think the police are doing a very good job and that um, they, they are in the process of wrecking people's lives in, in, the, in the course of trying to finally pin down who was responsible for Claudia going missing. There was a sense that her local community of friends have felt under pressure from the police because the police feel that there are some answers there among her friends, among her lovers. Um, to what extent is this community acting in concert or feel under threat? Is that a reasonable sense? Well, there probably are answers within that group. If she was having an affair with a married individual, maybe they don't want to come forward. The police need to put them under pressure. They need answers. They need people to come forward with information so as they can piece together exactly what happened to her. The tactics have been questioned about um, uh, you using an arrest to actually maybe apply pressure for people to talk. I think the police in this particular case have, have got to pay a bit of catch up. They've got to win the confidence back. Certainly when I was talking in, in uh, York, there was a little bit of resentment to the police. Possibly people weren't happy with the tactics the police were, you know, were actually using. And maybe that, that's something that the senior investigating officer will revisit. The police just need to re-win a little bit of confidence to allow people to be able to come forward and talk. Claudia's case lacks the one thing which the majority of investigations of this sort can rely upon, a body. Assuming Claudia was murdered, her killer was very skilled and precise in disposing of it. I've looked at the considerable amount of building and construction which was happening in the city of York at the time, and the potential was certainly there for the killer to hide a corpse thoroughly. However, the Yorkshire Moors and any wasteland within York could hold the key to finding her corpse. Her body has never been found. And therefore, if we think about that, that leads us to concentrate on that final journey that she made when she walked to work and the opportunities that gave for her to accept a lift or to be abducted by a stranger or a stranger into a car. It is, as far as the family is concerned, as far as Peter is concerned, the most likely explanation that something sinister has happened to her on her way to work. As far as the police are concerned, somewhere out there is someone who has murdered a young woman. And if they did that, then they are surely a continuing threat to young women. We have to look, for me, at the predator. We have to look at the fact that this man may still be at large. If you want to harm a 35-year-old woman and do it without being noticed, it's hard in a city centre because someone's going to see you. It's, it's difficult to move an adult person's body, particularly if you're on your own. So it would make most sense for Claudia to have left that house on her own accord. She left that house on her own two feet, I'm pretty certain. So what do we really think happened in this perplexing case? But at the moment, we, we have no sightings. We have absolutely nothing to suggest that Claudia is alive. Normally, that there would be a, a fingerprint of some description, a credit card, a phone, a ch someone being notified. We don't have any of that. And so I think the police are right to pursue this, to p assume the worst. And I, I've always felt the abduction in the morning. Um, and I did walk that little stretch. I, I, it, it doesn't sit well with me, even though I have to accept it is a possibility. I feel more likely that this might have been um, a meeting that has gone wrong, rather than possibly a group of lads or a lad or someone 
grabbing hold of her and throwing her in a car, but I didn't rule out the possibility she might have known someone who offered her a lift. The fact of the matter is, she was a 35-year-old woman, she was single. So what how she lived her life? It doesn't matter how she lived her life. She didn't deserve to be murdered. And what has to happen here is there has to be a confidence built up between her friends and, and those who were around her to come forward and give the police information. And one little piece of information could be the key to solving this case. The hunt for Claudia Lawrence and who murdered her, I think, is the most perplexing case, certainly the most perplexing serious crime case I've ever worked on. Nobody knows, or at least if anybody does know, they're not saying. The police walking into this story, which is what they did, thought that they would be easily able to describe Claudia. She was a 35-year-old, blonde-haired, daughter of a country solicitor, horse-loving chef in the university. And they pretty quickly discovered that there was a lot more to Claudia than that. I'm not certain they've discovered all of it yet. I'm feeling the same about the case. The frustration on the side of the locals and the friends and the family of Claudia who believe that the police have taken the case in the wrong direction is matched only by the frustration of the investigators who believe that there are plenty of people out there who aren't telling them anything. It's one of the most complicated and difficult cases I've come across. Appeals are issued annually and Claudia's parents desperately hope that somehow, some way, they will find out what happened to their daughter. It's very, very hard to get through each day. Very, very hard. It never goes away. It's with you 24-7. It just never, ever goes away. And Ali and I, we often say, you know, one day we keep thinking she'll come through the door and say, I'm back, Mum. It's difficult for me to conclude anything other than that Claudia Lawrence's disappearance and most probably her death is a tragedy and a puzzle which can be solved. The challenge is to get those who clearly know more than they're saying to talk. In her life, she was warm and vivacious, but in her absence, her reputation was left tarnished full of sexual innuendo. I don't believe that she was a victim of stranger danger. I don't believe she was abducted on her way to work or indeed from her own house. I believe she left her own home of her own volition for an overnight stay with a lover, a man with a complicated love life like her own. In summary, I believe that her personal life, her very private love life led to her very public, tragic disappearance.